Well, I say good afternoon to everybody. I welcome to the Meta Center. I am appreciative that most of you chose time to come out today. And this is one of the first lessons that we're giving this fall. And it's a special lecture, a very special one. Because as most of you are aware, there is an exhibit that's being shown at the Art Institute in Chicago along the Magnificent Mile. And it's been going on for a couple of months now. It's simply called Pharaohs of the Sun. I like to entitle this presentation, but I don't want to call it a lecture, I want to call it a presentation, The Truth About the Pharaohs and the Sun. The fall, of course, brings a lot of changes. It brings, again, uh, the need to clean the body, clean the mind, and gear up to a lot of schooling and hard work. And I think that that's been true for us for a long length of time, especially when you hear how much we're going to clear up and clean up tonight about a situation that happened roughly about 5,000 years ago that I think has been misreported, misinterpreted, and most definitely a miseducation factor is going on about it. The truth about the pharaohs is that that word pharaoh has struck not only a feeling of fear in some cases, when you talk about the ancient biblical epics, but a feeling of almost respect and adoration for others because of one thing that's associated with it. The mighty Giza Plateau, the pyramids, which there are not just three, there are five there, and the Great Pyramid, which is called Cheops Pyramid. That whole idea, and the Sphinx that sits in front of it, is part of the movie that you watched before this lecture. And we're going to have a follow-up with that for verification once we begin to present this. When you hear about the 18th dynasty of Egypt, it's as though Egypt had done very little until the 18th dynasty rolled around. You hear about many of the parables of Ramesses, you hear again of Ptolemy later on. But always the reference goes back to Amenophis, Amenhotep, Ankhenaten, Tutankhamun, Nefertiti, Queen Tai, Queen Mut, and all of the entourage about that. There's a reason for that. There seems to have been a special point in the turning point of our whole planet. What happened there, what got misrepresented, what got miseducated, and what was presented there was last, probably the last time when we had a bloodline connected to the gods here on this planet. And that's the best way I can put it. Now, I'm not asking for your religious beliefs or your toleration of religion. This has nothing to do with that. This is having to do with historical concepts, which most, many times are called historical facts. Now, how much is a fact? How much is a concept? That remains to be seen. One of the things that happens when you're dealing with the 18th dynasty is that you hear about a particular person called Ankhenaten. And I've heard all kind of fallacies, all kind of rhetoric about Ankhenaten. I heard that his name at one time was much like his father, Menhotep IV. I've also heard the Greek pronunciation called Amenophis. All of these referring to one man, Ankhenaten. He was a warrior, a general, and led many of the Egyptian armies on, uh, what would we say, capturing and pillaging and attaining for Egypt greater wealth and riches. One thing that you should always do when you understand and you talk about the 18th dynasty is to understand in the 17th and 16th dynasty, there is such a connection between Egypt and Nubia that to report one without the other is to be ludicrous. But for some reason, interesting enough, Historians don't tie in Nubia with Egypt. But yet, to not do so is to not understand history. If you remember that there were many times when the Egyptian Empire was threatened prior to its fall, when the Nubian Empire came up and offered not only groups, <coughs> but principles, ideas that helped Egypt become the mighty nation that it was and history to state what it did about it. Most of this is left out. But at the same time you leave out one thing, you find out that other things get to be left out. When you begin to pick and choose your history, you're taking a chance on leaving out some vitals that come back to haunt at a later time. It's been stated that the Sphinx is a forerunner of the Great Pyramid. That on that Giza Plateau complex, both wonders of the world sit staring away from each other, but looking at you. The Great Pyramid, a plot of over 550 million blocks of stone, compiling supposedly some 20 years to build, with 2,500,000 uh, participants and stone 
poundages, if you would, with some granite giants in there that weigh 250 tons, along in the king's chamber and all the passageways leading up to it. And the Sphinx itself, from 32 feet high to 240 feet long, only one person could guess as to what it weighs, and that must be Hawass, the, uh, the keeper of anthology out there, because it is carved out of one piece of granite. One piece of granite, 240 feet long, 32 feet high. The tonnage on that would have to be estimated. There's no machine could lift it. You can sound it and begin to get estimates, but that's all that you can do. It is a work of art and a challenge even today. If the pyramid, the great one, is enough challenge, the Sphinx becomes then a fairy tale. And yet there it stands. Because it stands there, it's been visited, revisited, hacked, cracked, lived in, talked about, and everything else, and movies made, and you just saw one about it. But one thing was glaringly clear. With the birthplace of, I'm sorry, the, uh, the death place of King Shepherd, sometimes known as Cheops, who was buried there with his entourage to attest to the magnificence of his kingdom. And of course, the two side tombs, uh, one is called Khufu's, I'm sorry, one is called Unclassified, and the other is Kepherd's. They don't know what's in there, and they stated again, these were also burial chambers. Well, the point is, except for bats and some invaders, they never found a body in the tomb. The king's chamber never contained uh, a sepulcher. It was called the open sepulcher, and the mystery of the open sepulcher, because when they finally got into the king's chamber, they found <coughs> one buried there, no sarcophagus there. And yet, here was supposedly the burial place of the mighty pharaohs, and the mightiest of all, both became Tutankhamun and Ankhetnaten. The truth is, it was never a tomb, never meant to be a tomb, and the lesser pharaohs who built 55 other ones around that area, and even going out to the Valley of the Kings in Luxor, were simply trying to emulate something that they could not duplicate. And they had themselves buried there in honor of trying to be considered a prelate and a god. It was never, none of them were ever used as tombs, those big ones. Not even the ones in Chickenitsa and Huxmall here in the United States. Not even right down here in Illinois at Cahokia State Park. None of those were ever true. Those are lies that are told about it because to tell you why they were built and who built them is to blow your mind. Hmm. And to give credence and homage to a people who have been bereft of almost everything for the longest. So consequently, rather than tell a truth, they'll manufacture fairy tales which are now being taught at colleges and universities and there aren't lies and they know that they're lies. When you tell a lie consistently, pretty soon you begin to believe your own lie. And that began to be a big problem here. Recently on uh, Art Bell show, which is now called uh, Mike Siegel's show, they had a person on and I was moved up to call. And I did call them. And I was able to get in. And I challenged the person that he had on there and what the person only said to me, or he didn't say anything to me, they didn't allow me to say anything afterwards, but I knew it, so I got my points in real quick. And I told him I didn't want to argue with him. I wanted to talk to his professor, to his expert, who had stated a lot of things like they're saying now about the Great Sphinx and about the, uh, the Pharaohs too. And I stated that it may not be like you think, and you have enough evidence to know that it's not like you're saying, so why do you continue to tell lies about it? But I said it in a nice way. And I named things that I know would get back to Professor Hogan, and I hope he's watching it, because he also knows that if he tells the truth, what I'm saying he'd have to agree to. And he has more money and more time to spend in archaeological research than I do. And I stated simply this, that when you begin to study the Sphinx, truthfully, when you begin to study the 18th dynasty, truthfully, you begin to understand the Viking pictures from Sedona on Mars, what they found on the moon, and what they found underneath the Giza Plateau, then you know good and well that there are certain things being hid. The punchline tonight will be what's being hid and why they're hiding. The 18th dynasty itself is not shrouded in mystery. It's shrouded in perfection. It's shrouded in a change of attitude, much like much go on again on the planet now. Attitudes on this planet must change. History will be writing us off as a desert area that was the area of Chicago or New York that we don't hurry up and change very soon because history does repeat itself. And for you to understand history, 
means that you don't see the signs of repetition. When you look at Akhenaten, who was called Amenophis, he went out in conquering areas and bringing riches and spoils back to Egypt. All conquerors do the same thing. Whether they have a change of heart later on, they do one thing. They want to bring back to their society riches. So you either mine for those riches, dig for those riches, or develop technology, or you go out and steal them from somebody else, or take them barbarically, and then underpay or non-pay a person to give you their riches. When you go out and discover a place where people are already living, then you're telling one lie on another lie. If you find in that person's house things that are wonderful and gratifying, and then you say, well, I discovered them there, but the person didn't know they were there, yet they built the house and put them in them, then somebody's a child. And somebody is a liar, and somebody is a fool. I'm not a fool, I'm not a liar, and I'm not a child. And therefore, I challenge these people when they make these kind of statements which they know are wrong. The point is, why did they make them, and can we give verification that something else happened? Part of the story that you don't hear about Ankhnaten is that on one of his, as a general, one of his army campaigns, he went to Singapore, or the area that we now call Singapore. At that time, it was called Taxila. Taxila. And there was a ruler in Taxila called the Freos. Some call it Freotes. I not argue about pronunciation on the syllable. But either way, this ruler in Taxila, which is Singapore, gave him a lot of information and showed that there was another way of studying the stars and that they had a way of prolonging life based, again, on understanding the human body and energy fields around the body, and that they were doing a lot of things with surgery and many things. This was in a place now called Taxila. He also stated that, as one of his seers had told him, that Akhenaten, I'm sorry, at that time, Amenophis, and some call him Amenhotep, we're talking about the same person, was going to do great things. And he could bring back and share, as an honest ruler, since he had the blood eye, with his people, things that could make the area he came from great. Well, the area he came from was Africa. Understand that Egypt is in Africa. And you cannot talk about the history of Egypt without talking about one of the heydays and hay places of Africa. When you cut out Egypt from Africa, you cut the heart out of the body. Because it took a long time at that little peninsula for it to develop what it did. So bringing back to Africa came a great general who was so moved by the metaphysics of what he saw and the land in which he visited that he wanted to adopt a new policy. He became sick and angered by what he had done. He said he did it in ignorance, and never again would he be ignorant. He began to see wondrous things that could be done with meditation, with taking of certain nice herbs, and not what we would call the drugs and things, but what could be done with a keen thought of mind and a clear soul. And he came back and said he would venerate what he had done and bring back to the people a new consciousness, and which he did do. He changed his name from whatever it was before. And they say whether you go with a mental tip or Amenophis, really doesn't matter. What he chose to call himself, it's like many people are going through name changes now, they feel the need to do so, and therefore I honor what he called himself, Ankh Akhenaten, or one with Aten, who was said to be the God Supreme. Now understand, in the plurality of gods that Egypt had, that was brought up from Nubia, Ra was a supreme being. Let's think of Ra then as the creator now. When you use the word creator, you have no other ways of expressing. When I use it, I mean the supreme cosmic cosmology, the consciousness of the all, the I am. Now, I'm not talking about Buddha. I'm not talking about Zoroaster. I'm not talking about Christ. I'm not talking about uh, Muhammad. I'm talking about Ra, the supreme. The rest of them were prelates, or people either who had manifested such wonders that they were worshipped, or deities that they had created in name for a particular people. This is why we have 285 different kind of religions now, each one with a supreme head, and each person knowing that theirs is the best and yours is nothing. So let's say that ours are all nothing, because we have mixtures of religion. But let's just say if we can agree that something had to make all of it or start it, Let's just call that person as they did Ra. Okay? Aten was not Ra. Aten was the local god that was brought back from Taxila by Amenophis, who changed his name to Aten. But understand, all he was saying was Aten 
A T E N, you know I'm called Aton, A T O N, from which we get our word atone. Mm -hmm. Because he atoned for his ignorance and said at least he had a name for the Most High. And it was better than having a plurality of gods because it stated that to go to this God who you were part of, you simply had to go within and spend some time. Well, you can imagine what the priest of Amun thought about that. The priest of Amun, who were called themselves Amun Ra, mm -hmm. those who were the dignitaries, the bringers of Ra, you had to go through the priest in order to get to Ra. And, as in most cases, you tied your way there. <laughs> just hurt your feelings? I'm sorry. <coughs> don't go to church and don't tithe. I'm not denouncing tithing. The person should do with their money what they choose to. Well, no skill from another person to do it. But the whole point was that as they tithe, they began to then control the people. And they gave the people a list of do's and don'ts. Most churches do, don't they? Right. Most religions have right. do's and don'ts. They had their do's and don'ts also. And their do's and don'ts simply told them things they should do and things they shouldn't do. But with the priest of Almond, on some of those you shouldn't do if you did them, it was a little bit more than being kicked out of the church. You got racked and hurt and every other thing. And that seems to have been the way with most religions ever since. If you keep up with the Inquisition. So what he did was completely different. Here's a top general, other than that, that had his head as soon as he came back. But he came back after he had rain, filling the coffers of Egypt with gold and jewels, <coughs> riches and incense and everything else. And then he also came back and said, he was through campaigning, that Egypt should get its wealth another way, and it was a time for Egypt now to use their spoils, to use their bounty, to use those things in a more benevolent way, and become very pious, kept a couple of generals who helped to keep him from being overthrown because the priest of Amun immediately stated, off with his everything, not just his head. They did not believe that now here is this person who they had been in favor of, who had such great power, now saying, do no longer go to church worshiping the priest of Ra and Amun, but go within your own temple and worship Aton. Well, you can understand from that time on it was a conspiracy to get rid of Amenophis, whatever his name was, who must have been crazy. And so before, there's this old statement that those whom the gods would destroy, first they make mad. Watch that very closely in the age you're living in too. Those that the gods would destroy, first they make mad. Not mad by anger, but doing things that are just ludicrous, madness, and I think if you watch closely, that's what's happening again. Akhenaten had many wives. He was a general. Any woman in the kingdom was his for the asking. He had babies. If you would notice what they call armana, what they call uh, stylized drawings, anytime you start talking about the bloodline of Akhenaten, and before him Queen Kai, his mother, and Boot, and so, they always talk about stylized armanas. It means that they begin to say they look different. They look real different. And they even devised a headwear to somewhat camouflage their difference. If you notice on any of the pictures of Tutankhamun or Akhenaten, you will see the same kind of thing bearing there. And I will show you pictures to back up what I'm going to say. This is the one that you saw when you went to the museum there. You see it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. looks. Uh -huh. You understand one is the father, the other is the son. Mm -hmm. One is Ankhnaten, the other is the common. Okay? Mm -hmm. He wanted to get another baby. He had many. But with his new consciousness, he wanted to see with his new consciousness placed in a vessel of a woman who would be the mother of who he hoped would be a beautiful creature a psychic, and a ruler that Egypt could be proud of. And so, conserving his seed and going into meditation, he still searched, and in his journeys, he had come across a person by the name of Nefertiti, who was a commoner, who was uh, a dancer, had lots of wealth, but didn't get wealth from the bloodline, got wealth from the spoil of her body and her brains. But she had one thing that really attracted him. And that is the same thing that attracted everybody and puts a 
uh, collusion, if you would, over the 18th dynasty. I'll tell you what that is shortly. Seeing her, he knew by her physiognomy that she was one of the ones that he needed at this particular time. And asking her, begging her, and talking with her, she came into Egypt. A very beautiful dancer, uh, seer, another attribute. She was also a psychic. And they produced a son. Now, there is a lot of argument about the produce, production of this son, that there was a lot of collusion going on, and I will bring it out very clearly right now. We will not evade this either. Some have said that there was incest in that dynasty, and that many of the children there were not through the wives of Akhenaten, but through his mother, Tai. And the idea also has been brought about that, that Tutankhamun was the son of Tai and Akhenaten, and not Nefertiti. Now, as terrible as that sounds, understand the dynasty that now rules you, elected or selected. And all the little things that are going on in the house that they live in, which is not called the Black House. Understand, too, the things that may be going on there, and the fathering of certain children that have been sent to Australia and all things like this didn't quite look the way that they should. And understand that rulers that are men always dominate the female in a patriarchal society. And understand that babies are made all around the place. He had many daughters and sons. But the only son <coughs> that goes on record is Toot, or some call him Tut. Okay? So I cover that too without bridging that one. Because that's one of the rumors behind the scenes, too, about the lineage of the parentage of Tutankhamun. Either way, conceived he was, and when he was <coughs> eight years old, came into power on the throne. But before that time, Akhenaten died. Akhenaten didn't die of old age. Akhenaten died very young. Some say 33 or 34. Interesting how these 33s and so come about. Akhenaten died of being poisoned. And the rumor was that he was poisoned by a conspiracy of the priest of Amun using Nefertiti as the catalyst. Proven or disproven, only time will soon tell. Very soon will tell. The idea was that Nefertiti, first adoring and being wonderfully to be able to be sitting on the throne of Egypt, began to get worried because all he did was to sit in meditation. He disbanded his army. Only the troops that had served him well stayed with him and protected him because everybody else that was in the hierarchy wanted him dead. Why? One reason. He set the people free. Free from the church, free from enslavement, and told them that they could go within and build the biggest empire they wanted within themselves first and that they did not have to go to anybody else but to do it for self, do for self. Do for self has always been a strange word in an empirical society which wants to dominate you. Because when you do for self, you think for self. When you think for self, you're not easily led, nor are you easily misled. Are you still with me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Understand the true circumstances behind the fatal thing that this man did. Now he sits upon the throne, spending most time in meditation and leaving to others the chores of the empire. Nefertiti was asked many times to offer, I'm sure, great sums of money, and probably everything else he wanted, because they were afraid to attack him outright because of his piousness, not only with the army that still served him, but the people who have uprisen and Egypt would have been over. So they had to do it in a way that would not draw attention, but seem natural. And so it was seen that the blood of the asp would be put to the neck of Akhenaten or into his food. And whether or not it was conspiratorial, between Nefertiti, only conspiratorial with the priest of Amun, or whatever, he died suddenly of a heart attack, stroke, and extreme blood poison. Out went Akhenaten. But he left his seed, and the seed, of course, was King Tut. King Tut took the throne, and the priest of Amun or somebody conspired to get rid of Tut real quickly. Why? Because Tut became worse than the father who had just passed. Tut was born a psychic. He was the seventh son. <laughs> Tut was born a seer and began to tell people things and deeds that were in the empire that nobody was supposed to know. Tut was a prophet. And Tut not only had the power of his father, but the power of hypnosis by looking. 
He had the evil eye or the glorified eye. He, he became a danger. And it was understood by Abnan he would be. And either Tai, his mother, or Nefertiti also knew he would be. Because they understood what's in the blood is in the flesh. And this is what has been kept away. Now there are whole bloodlines being kept intact. But nobody tells you why the rights of kings were there and people intermarried and had incest or whatever else they did. It was to keep alive certain cells in the blood. They could trigger certain responses in the hormones. They could make people different. What they all had in common was the long head. The head of the gods. The head of people who came from space. And they became the heads of state. The long heads is what they're always hiding. Never want to talk about the advanced, extreme, occipital lobes, if you would. And very few pictures will show you either Nefertiti's head, never show you Akhenaten's head. And when you see it, they say it's Telemarna, it's Armana, it is stylized characteristics of the artist of the day. Well, the artist of the day took great license with the people who they suppose, a person who they supposed to be not only feared, but respected. You kept doing me looking even uglier than I am long enough, I think I'd have resented it. And you know as a female, Nefertiti would have resented it. Beautiful was the long head. And in parts of Africa, they still try to elongate the cranium and the head, showing you it was the head of the gods. They also slatted their eyes, which made them look very funny. Nobody ever asked why. In every picture you see them, with the eyes always exaggerated. Right. And nobody asked about the snakes on top, the rest. But they tell you it's upper and lower Egypt, mm -hmm. over at the hawk, the hawk beat. These are metaphysical symbols. Not only is it on seven levels of understanding, but the physical one is obviously right there. They wanted slant eyes, they wanted a beard, or something that grew at the, at the chin. Remember again, it was either, I forget the, the, the only female ruler there, Hapshatsu, who even tied one on. This was a sign of something, of wisdom that came with it. And no matter where you go with that one, that's what you see. But there's one, hope I didn't lose that, that you usually don't see. Okay, I hope that I can see where I put that one right quick. There's one picture of the common that you normally don't see, and if I'm able to, I want to show it again. But it shows, here we go. This is the one of, um, let me make sure I put it first thing, King common. The picture right there. Now that's one they should have had a guard in. If I can get it here, it mean they with their millions couldn't try and find this one. Okay? To the comments. Look at the length of that head there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now they again say it's stylized. So I'm on a heart. So on again like that. That's one that actually shows an intact. When you see his daughters before him, which means it was still in his blood. Extremely long heads. They even designed these things to flap in front so it cut off the height and length of their head. They were extraterrestrials. They were not aliens. They were extraterrestrials. They crossed between an alien and an Earth terrestrial person. Extraterrestrial. With extra powers, extra kind of funny looks, and extra kind of metaphysical blood that had them able to do many things that is now not being able to be duplicated so they can duplicate the same cell structure. That's why the long heads with the extreme assembly of lobe, which gave you a lot of psychic power, were honored. Because you couldn't lie to them. And seemingly there were other things when taking certain substances that they could do that normal people could not. They were not normal people. They were the 18th dynasty kings. They were supposed to be sons of the gods and daughters of the moon. Isis and Osiris. Special folks in power. All of that is usually hidden. All of that I bring out from your judgment and research today. <coughs> What's very interesting too, as Ra was the Olympian god, the overseer of the cosmos, Heru and Horus were the lesser gods. And it's been said that if you see the Masonic symbol and on your dollar bills many a time, you see the eye of Horus or Heru above. Heru also means sun. We now call these people you have a son, and you have a daughter. But you see, there are two meanings to son, S-U-N and S-O-N. The overall Ra was the overall ruler, the sun god of the cosmos. But Heru and Horus, offsprings of the gods. People with a little bit of that energy in them 
but yet also some humanity. And I hate that word because we understand what human means as animal men. These were man, not a kind of man. These were men. These were the men that were the, of the gods that had come to earth. All of that allowed them to do many things, and they worked in conjunction with many things in our cosmos, in our solar system, and places on our earth that we're now just beginning to unearth. Remember the word Helen means what? To cover. The word hell comes from Helen, covered over place. And they referred to it at that time as Amenta, the land of sticks and the rivers, Tigris and Euphrates. And they all came together and there was something hidden down there. And that's why they built that temple right there. You're finding out now just how wonderful that place is and how awful it can be if you misuse it. What's interesting, too, is that the very city of Cairo, which was never spelled with a C, C and C-H came from the Greeks. They used no C and C-Hs in ancient times. Everything was K, the standing crane with the foot up, mm. K, because they used hieroglyphics, red and columnar, not linear, columnar, and they also used what they call symbols. Unfortunately, now, we have Egyptologists who interpret the symbols for us. In fact, we have most things interpreted for us now. And when you do that for us, instead of just us, there'll be none. You with me? No justice. Can't be. Because you have a foreign power interpreting a history that you were supposed to have, but were mistaught and forgot. That's why Egypt can never be part of Africa, but is. When you see the word Cairo, it was not Cairo. That is what the Greeks called it. It was called El Kahir, Kahira, and El Kahir, the place of God, and also it means Mars. Cairo means Mars. El Kahir, the place of Mars. Now we get into a whole new circumstance, which is him wearing me back. And obviously, if they can't tell the truth on Earth. <laughs> Why would they tell you the truth on Mars? But here it comes, and there it is. They have what they call the Viking probes going to Mars to see if there can be life on Mars. They have down in Puerto Rico great disks sitting, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Have to search it to see if it's out there somewhere in the cosmos. That just amazes me. All the wasted money to see if they're out there and they've been studying them for as long as they can remember they thought they were intelligent. But they got to go out and search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Life out there. Trillions of other planets, but you know that it all revolves around Earth. We can't even see them, but they're revolving around Earth waiting for intelligent life to be here. Well, if you believe that, for instance, I have 50 bridges I want to say next month. What's very interesting about all of this, they get there and they see a pyramid structure, but the pyramid structure also is compounded with a very special symbol, a pentagon symbol. Anybody ever heard of the pentagon before? Yes. <laughs> We're always so original. We never duplicate anybody else's history. We didn't see, we did not see anything. Here's this five-pointed thing here called the pentagon, and they found up near a place called Sidona on Mars another five-sided structure. Not only that, they found another glaring artifact, a sphinx. Mm. No, a face. Thanks. No, a structure. No, a natural geological formation that looked almost like it was intelligently drawn. That's the one they used. But not because no intelligent life could be on Mars, because no life could be anywhere on Earth. Your religion told you that, right? So what are they spending all the money, your money, all the time, your time, to do things on a place where nothing could be of intelligence. Because they found something up there so intelligent that they found it had been duplicated on Earth. What they saw above, which Mars sits a little higher, is all they saw below. So above, so below. So as in the Giza Plateau, so is on Sidona. And to let you see the extraterrestrial connection, they called the same thing that was there when they left, when they came here, Cairo, the new Mars. Guess where the Martians went? Earth. 
guess who some of them are? She says, oh. Uh oh, you're thinking. That's going to hurt. That's going to really hurt. They recently made a movie called Mission to Mars. Great movie, wonderful special effects. I was drawn into it. I love space stuff and all. And everything was good until they had to cover up the lie, and then the movie fell apart. Well, let's look at it. How many of you saw the Mission to Mars movie? Okay. We're going to have a movie fest here either next week or next week, which is going to bring you out probably over a, two, over a weekend all of the movies that met something. And we're going to tie them together for you. Because they will tell the truth in movies. They will not tell the truth in his story. <laughs> but that is a Miz story. This mission had five astronauts, all dead, all succumbing to the Martian influence and the things that happened up there, except one, a black guy. Now, when they left the black guy alive in the movie, at the beginning of the movie, I knew something was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> black woman they keep around a little bit longer than a black man. I'm sorry to hurt you. I tell truth. Right. Now, I knew something had to be interesting about this. I said, well, what is it? He didn't know why he was alive when the next mission to Mars found him there with a lot of herbistry, a lot of biological things, certainly of oxygen. Halfway crazy, and I guess sitting alone on Mars for a long time, I guess you could go a little bit uh, neurotic. But there he was, and so they asked him, why does he think he was fair? And he simply said, I don't know. Well, that was the third meter flag. He didn't know. <coughs> the brothers, one of the brothers that made that movie, um, get it right now. But anyway, if you, somebody remembers it, bring it back again. Uh, they were Italian people, and you have a little bit more liberalness amongst Italians about their history. Plus, you have Sicily and Rome right there, so they have to be a little bit more liberal with their honesty. And plus, you have more racism here than you have in most places on this planet. Right here in the country, the home of the free and the land, a lot of racism. And especially in history, because there's a great fear here, because of the minority population that is a majority that nobody knows. At any rate, when you look at this figure that is there, and you see this man, this Negroid looking, they say it, and they begin to hint that the very area that he was near, this big five-mile-long, two-mile-wide edifice called Sphinx, may have looked like him. But they couldn't say that. So from starting out to make it the reason why this Negroid-looking person was spared, because he looked like some of the ancestor Martians, they suddenly knew that not only might they get killed, but the movie might not make any money because they probably couldn't release it here in the United States. I mean, there's no control of movies here in the United States. We understand, right? No censor boards or anything here. Right? Because it is the internet movie, right? Oh, okay. Anyway, since there isn't, we have to speculate. So I'll go on my neurotic binge and say, maybe that was the reason. And I'll see if you're in your intelligence, maybe agree. But whatever happened was, they made... They, they found this guy, and then they went into this big complex, whatever it was, this sphinx. And once they went inside, they made a couple of little references, very cute ones. One said, we're inside the white face. <laughs> no, we're inside the, the, yeah, the face that's white. Well, it was, according to the movie. The halls inside were all white, <laughs> and so on and so forth. But the tie-in was they went inside a white face. See? Nicely done. They didn't say that. They can't be accused of saying it. So any historical researcher taking them to task, we didn't say that. But they do the mental mind spin game by which you substitute the left out. And therefore, you are right in line for a big fall. Then they finally said they saw this hologram of the Martians leaving, and they had to flee. Didn't say exactly why, but they went on to double talk, and they left. But they looked like insectoids. And it came close to what we're seeing here if you just draw out real, real slender the face that you saw at the Art Institute. Okay? So therefore, now we're left to begin to think that if you begin to think the bloodline was there, it was that of an insectoid. <coughs> and that insectoids can be intelligent. And in the Creator's universe, every phylum has its state. Well, I honor that. I think that's very altruistic. But they found that there was a Negroid-looking face. And I will give you, if you tell enough tales, and I don't get marked, because now you can become researchers. 
and I will give you the keys to your research, which nobody gave me. Please make the notes in your mind, if not on paper. Here are the ways you can begin to find out about that face on Mars. Number one, I state that it is the face of a Negroid female, as was the Sphinx at the Giza Plateau. Not only a Negroid and not a male, but a female. Number two, that the history of that temple that they found on Mars has its, its building blocks in what was found at a place called Granada here on Earth. And if you remember, they invaded Granada some time right. ago. Right. See, nobody right. can understand. I think mm -hmm. the historical parallel is this. 33 white people. Mm -hmm. Let's just call it like it is. And I'm not a racist. Okay? I am a truth seeker. They were all white. Had to be rescued on Granada from a lot of Negroid people who maybe were going to have an uprising and who stated again that they may be in danger. The people asked this certain uh, these invading or these coming troops, what are you saving us from? Why are you here? But they said, we understood there was going to be an uprising and so, so we came to save you. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, 52 little half-trained policemen held off, I think it was like 200 Marines, mm -hmm. for a whole day and a half, outmanned, outgunned, and so on and so forth, because they were fighting for their lives, and these other people were just following orders. But it was to save these 33 people who didn't know why they needed to be saved. And they even asked, what is happening? Well, what is happening is that you got your spoon tasted again. The cast oil was mixed in with your liquids. The sweet was in with the bag. I feel, and research I think may show, that what they came there for was to destroy a postage stamp and a post office, in which the Lady of the Islands was featured, which was the last places where this postage stamp was. And the Lady of the Islands was simply a queen, whether she was like Lady Kalani, or whomever, and she represented and looked more like the face on Mars with her cornrows and hair than anything else they had. And in fear that they would make a tie in between this queen of the islands and the face on Mars, they tried to destroy every trace of the stamp, its overlay, and the history of this woman. Now, you know where to start your search and you know what to look for. That stamp probably would bring you millions if you could get it. It used to be prolific in the islands because this woman is known. So if you go and ask some of the islanders there, they'll tell you her name. And they'll tell you about it because you can't wipe out the whole trace of it. But you can wipe out the post office that was carrying those things. Now, wouldn't that be far off if that's the real reason behind it? Yeah. And I know you say, you've taken a big one this time. But let's just look real quickly at three things that happened. World War II. You've never been told the truth about how that started. And the movie Tora 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 tells you that the British cracked the Japanese code and the world Pearl Harbor did not have to happen. And there's a lot of intrigue there. Vietnam supposedly started when this torpedo boat from North Vietnam came into Haiphong Harbor and actually uh, attacked two cruise, no, a cruiser and destroyer under tow, which means moving, and started Vietnam. Now here is a heavily manned cruiser and a destroyer and a PT boat attacks it. That's like a flyer taking me on. No, let's just call it a mosquito take me on and say, I'm bringing you down, baby. Get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Under tow means these things were making knots. These things were moving in the water. They got torpedoes. They got death charges. They got helicopters. They got an assault uh, 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 ship that can be launched in the air. They got <laughs> heat-seeking missiles. And it's proteinable. And of course, once that's done, then you started the Vietnamese War. I'm saying, you never get the truth. And how does that guy say in the movie? You don't. You can't. That's well, tell it for me. You can't take the truth. You can't handle the truth. They can't. And you won't. So now, who does it matter who was the first liar when the third person believes the lie? <laughs> I give you some tidbits and hints. I'll let you reach your own conclusion. I always honor people and I always tell people one thing. Other people tell you what to do and what to think. I tell you there is no truth 
until you decide what truth is when you're honest and intelligent. I add those two parts to it. Tai Nefertiti, historical and archaeological misinterpretations, and even the ancient texts by which they come close to telling the truth, but still have to make a little stretch. Everybody seems to like Zachariah Sitchin. And they like him because he's supposed to be a great researcher. And he has put the history of Sumer into a text called the Sumerian text and interpreted it so everybody can understand it. And supposedly this is one of the best pieces of archaeology and historical findings that can be brought about. And still, Sitchin states that there is what is called Nebiru. And Nebiru, the 12th planet, or the space ship that came in, or something else, produced possibly some of the races that are on Earth, and that's what he comes down to. On only one book, he used to carry the Sitchin Chronicles, does he get into talking about possibly that they may have been Negroid looking. And he refers to them as the Anunnaki, those that fell from the sky. Understand, in ancient Egypt and in Nubia, they also had a plurality of gods. And the original 12 gods, so, included Neb. And the offshoot later on of Neb became Heru, and also Horus. I make a suggestion to you. Nebiru may be Neb Heru. And if Neb Heru is Nebiru, you've got your puzzle solved. Maybe we slur Nebiru looking for a 12th planet, instead of putting Earthman Neb and Heru the god creating the 12th planet's dynasty right here on Earth after they left Mars and other places due to a great calamity that happened in our planet, in our solar system, when the 13th planet exploded. 